Hello Sharks, Jonathan Little here. Before we get started with today's video, I wanted to tell you about a promotion I'm running because we almost have 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. We're gonna be giving away $1,000 to one lucky winner of a giveaway. Also, we're gonna give away one hour of poker coaching with me to three lucky winners. To get in the giveaway that closes as soon as we get to 100,000 subscribers, head over to pokercoaching.com slash 100K. Now let's get to the video. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little for PokerCoaching.com, here today reviewing a hand from the most recent season of Poker After Dark. And at the end of this, I'm going to show you a clip that I had in the most recent season of Poker After Dark reviewing this actual hand on the air. It was a lot of fun producing those segments. Huge thanks to Poker Go for making it happen. This is from episode one of this season, and here we are watching the Braddy Bunch play. It's called the Braddy Bunch because it's Phil Helmut's home game and he is the poker brat. Here we have Chamath under the gun straddling. They're playing 100, 200, 400, very, very deep stacked. Alan Keating raises it up, and then David Sachs opts to call as well. David Sachs is a tech entrepreneur, as are most of the people in this game, including Jason Calacanis, Bill Gurley, Chamath, um, he elects to limp as well. Also, three of these players at the table have a pretty cool podcast called the All In Podcast. I like it a lot. It features Jason, David, and Chamath. So if you want a fun podcast to listen to where they talk about all sorts of stuff, check it out, the All In Podcast. All right. So we have a limp here. Jason Calacanis folds as he should. Bill Helmuth likes to limp it in with the ace for offsuit, which is probably fine, and Bill calls as well. So we see a five-way flop. Jason wish he had the jack two, but he folded. Flop comes queen, jack two, two spades. Everybody has a very junky holding besides, I suppose, David Sachs with middle pair and Alan Keating with middle pair. Checks around to Alan Keating, and this is a spot where I think that he should probably just check. When you have middle pair multi-way, you may think there's value in betting and making your opponents fold out hands with equity, but usually your opponents are going to fold out hands with like three outs. And take a look here, right? If people fold, they're going to be folding out, what, ace four? Like, do you really care if your opponent sticks around to the turn with ace four? Not really. Um, you may be able to get some hands with decent equity to fold or put in money poorly, like let's say king nine for a gut shot and an overcard, but usually that's not such a big deal whenever your middle pair is decent. So I definitely think Allen should just check. And similarly, I think David Sachs should check with his middle pair better kicker, because if he bets and gets called or raised, it's miserably bad. But if it checks through, he gets to see the turn and then try to not fold his hand. He does opt to bet, though. And what's going to happen here is any hand that is drawing really, really thin is going to fold, and you're only going to get called by decent pairs that have okay equity and draws that have a lot of equity and better hands that actually beat you. And interestingly enough, Alan Keating actually does have one of the hands that David Sachs is thrilled to be up against with the same middle pair, but a worse kicker. This is a pretty tough spot for Alan. Um, I think he probably just has to call getting good odds here, which he does. Turn comes to 10 of clubs. Alan checks, and now David has to figure out what he should do. Remember, he doesn't know that Alan has a worse hand here. He assumes Alan has a reasonable range because he called a flop bet, right? Alan's not going to check call the flop with... 8-7 of clubs, right? He probably has either a queen, a jack, a two, a flush draw, or a straight draw, right? So no, assuming that, what should David do in this spot? I want you to pause the video and write in the comments section below if you think David should check, bet small, like 1,000, bet medium, like 2,000, or bet big, like 4,000. Pause the video and write what you would do in the comment section below. All right, did you do it? Good. Going through this process is gonna go a long, long, long way to helping ensure you play good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. And assuming Alan's range is anywhere near reasonable, this is a spot where David just has to check. Because if he bets and gets called, he's mostly gonna be against hands that have very good equity, many of which actually beat David's King Jack. You may say, but wouldn't Alan always bet a queen or better on the flop? 
And I don't think so. If you gave Alan Keating Queen 9 on the flop, he would at least consider checking it. Also, don't forget that Alan Keating, loose, aggressive, battling player, may sporadically put a check raise in on you, which would be terrible, right? When you have a very clear marginal made hand that really does not want to make the pot giant, you just want to check and you want to see a cheap showdown. The great thing about David Sachs' King Jack here is also that if it goes check-check on the turn, he can just call any river bet because by checking the turn, he will have induced bluffs from Allen. I actually have a quiz available for you to take to make sure you understand the fundamentals. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. If you get any of those questions wrong, you need to brush up on your poker skills. This is a spot where I think it's a pretty easy check for David, but he goes for a medium-sized bet. And again, if somehow he knew exactly what Alan Keating had, I guess this plays fine. But remember, we don't know exactly what Alan has. Sometimes Alan's going to have any queen. Sometimes he's going to have the queen 10, particularly, or the jack 10, right? Sometimes he's going to have random king 9 or 9-8. And sometimes Alan Keating, with the heart of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, is going to put in the raise. Alan is a very strong, aggressive opponent. And at this point... I am pretty sure he is reading into David's bet sizing with the dinosaur eyes and mouth correctly, assuming that David has a strong but non-nut hand. And Alan has made it crystal clear through this episode that if he thinks you have a non-nut hand, he's going to pounce and he is going to attempt to collect this pot. So that is what he does. He decides to make it 6,000. It's actually a pretty cool spot because if you think about it, Allen probably doesn't have a whole lot of premium hands, right? Because you got to think he would at least consider bluffing the king nine on the flop. He'd probably just fold nine eight on the flop. Maybe he splashes, who knows? Um, he could have jack ten, but does he really want to be raising jack ten into David, who could easily have king nine or queen jack or queen ten, right? It's one of these spots where the play doesn't actually make sense. But if your opponent's going to bet too wide and let you run them over, then I love the play, but I don't think this is going to work so great against absolute world-class players because they're going to look at this and they're going to figure out that when David Sachs bets small here, his range is probably a lot of marginal-ish hands, and if his range is very marginal, Allen, loose, aggressive, battling Tyrannosaurus, is going to pounce. Therefore, King Jack just cannot fold. And to be fair, David Sachs does call, which I think is good and fine. Alan decides to blast it on the river. He goes for the pot size bet. And this is where I think David messed up because you know what David did? He deposited his cards in the muck pretty quickly. He called the turn, presuming, all right, I'm just going to try to get there and try to get a straight or trips, right? The problem, though, is that he did not correctly realize that his range looked marginal to Alan. And if your range looks marginal to a very strong, aggressive, battling player. They are going to pounce. And when they pounce, they're going to eat your lunch. They're going to eat the pot. And knowing that, David has to realize that he has induced a bluff by betting small on the turn. If you've induced a bluff and your opponent's inclined to bluff, and you have a very good bluff catcher, and you block the straights, and you block the two pairs, you just have to call. Very, very easy call in this scenario for David, I think, and he let it go. And I want to make it clear. I actually respect these players very much for their business prowess, and I'm not trying to, um, you know, criticize their play or anything. I'm just trying to help all of you make sure you do not make this same mistake. This fold would be great if Alan Keating was a weak passive player, but it's not good if he is a loose, aggressive player, and Alan made it clear he was in there trying to win every pot that looked like it was available for purchase. So that's me for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, click the like and subscribe button below. And now I have something special for you. Mr. Editor, cue the poker after dark segment that I did really quick for a nice little summary. Sir, yes, sir. Before the break, Alan Keating bluffed David Sachs out of the pot. And for more on that hand, let's send it down to poker pro Jonathan Little. Hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan Little of PokerCoaching.com. And let's analyze this interesting spot. On the turn, David Sachs has a decently strong hand in middle pair, but it's a spot where it is still easy for him to be beat by top pair or two pair or straight. In spots like this, you should often check behind and look to call a bet on most rivers so you don't get blown off your hand by a check raise. When Allen does make the turn check raise 
and gets called, he correctly realizes that his middle pair is probably not good. While he may have a little bit of showdown value, he opted to use his hand as a bluff, which is a very, very good play against players who will bet too wide on the turn. If David instead just checked behind on the turn, he could have easily called a river bet, and that would have worked out way better for him. How would you like to play with me on Poker After Dark? Well, now is your chance. I'm giving away one $5,000 buy-in seat to play with me next season. Head over to pokercoaching.com slash pokerafterdark to enter the giveaway. All right, I hope you enjoyed that little snippet of the new season of Poker After Dark. Remember that you can watch the episodes right now if you head over to pokergo.com. I have strategy segments in a lot of these episodes, so make sure you check that out. And if you like these strategy segments, let the people at Poker Go know. I would appreciate that. Good luck in your games, have fun, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for watching today's video. And before you move on and do other things, make sure you get in the 100K subscriber giveaway. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash 100K. We're giving away $1,000, a bunch of private coaching, and much more. It's free to get in. It's just waiting for you. Head over to pokercoaching.com slash 100K right now before you move on to whatever the next video is. Good luck. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. And as a thank you, I'm going to channel all of my poker knowledge into your brain right now. Oh wait, that didn't work. Sorry, you're gonna have to keep studying. Go ahead and click the subscribe button right here and I'll see you in the next video.